So hi, welcome to Makeover Repair. I've literally just finished shooting a video in which I repair this oscilloscope. Uh, hopefully that'll be up on the uh, channel soon. But as I explored the diagrams in my normal fashion, there was one that I was quite quick about and a little bit dismissive because it wasn't a huge concern to me. There was only one section that I was interested in. Uh, and it was this diagram. So here it is. Now this is the channel switcher. So I pretty much said, here's a bunch of logic that decodes the switches. And here's a bunch of diodes down here, which do all the channel switching and the trigger switching and all that sort of activity. So we've got four uh, A channel triggers, four B channel triggers, because this is dual triggered. And we've got eight inputs here, which are in differential pairs. So four differential pairs, one for channel one, one for channel two, one, and so on. And the switching between these channels is not just on off, depending whether the channel's on off, but it might have to chop between them at very high frequency, or it might have to do, you know, one trace in one channel, then we get flyback and we do trace on another channel, flyback, trace on another, and so on. So that's what this is doing. And the output from the channels then goes into a differential amplifier just here. So let me just zoom in so we can kind of see that a little bit better. So here are our differential channels. So here's channel one at the top, these two inputs here. And we can see that literally there's just a couple of diodes. And uh, yeah. So there's a diode in this top line that joins it to this wire coming down here, which goes through that resistor and into one leg of the differential amplifier. If we take the other leg, it goes to a different resistor and again into a second leg of the differential amplifier just here. So literally all the channels just go together through a bunch of diodes. So the question is, how is that acting as a switch? How are we choosing which one we want? Now the answer is by applying a DC bias to these diodes. Now, uh, this is a little bit complicated, this diagram as it stands, so I'm gonna simplify this down and show it you on a breadboard. If you're used to RF circuits, you'll have seen this before. There's nothing um, all that exciting about it. But if you haven't, then you might be interested to see how just a humble diode can work as a switch. Okay, so I've tried to make the demonstration circuit about as easy as I can. Kept it down to the minimum number of components, uh, one. So what I've got here is I've got a 100 kilohertz signal coming in and it is a, and it's a 200 millivolts peak to peak. So there it is, a nice sine wave coming into this diode, passes through the diode and into the oscilloscope, which has got a 50 ohm load attached. Now the 50 ohm load is to ensure that we get some current flowing through this diode. If we don't have current flowing through the diode, this won't work. And we've also got a capacitor in here because the scope is AC coupled. Um, and we would need a capacitor in our circuit somewhere because we're going to apply some DC voltage to this diode. Now here is my input signal. Let's just turn it up a bit so we can kind of see it clearly. Coming in. So on this uh, red wire, I have got my AC signal coming in. I've got a whole bunch of grounds here. Um, the, the other end of this resistor, by the way, isn't connected. It's just a useful terminal. And I'm going to disconnect that yellow wire for a second. That's my power supply. So that's it. That is the circuit. So I've got my signal coming in here and this other red wire is my output to my scope. If I move that across to the other end of the diode, you'll see there's no signal. So this, this diode here has perhaps, you know, let's say 400, maybe 700 millivolts forward voltage drop. So if I don't apply a 700 millivolt signal, I'm not getting anything through this diode. I mean, I'll get a tiny bit because the response of a diode is of course like that. So this is about 700 millivolts. This is the current going this way. So down here at let's say 350 millivolts, I've got virtually nothing happening. And then it gets very rapidly quicker um, and becomes linear up in this region here. So when I switch my diode on, I actually want it to be working in this area up here, way above the 700 millivolts, not in the 350 millivolt region. And we'll see that as we, uh, as we do the experiment. 
So anyway, we've got our diode connected up. We've got our input there. We've got our scope connected exactly as in this diagram and the scope is showing nothing. So let's connect some power to this. Now, for my power, I've got a plus voltage coming in and I'm putting it through a 100K, so a 1K resistor just to limit the current a little bit, but also so that we get better control. It will kind of regulate a little bit with this diode. As this diode conducts more, this will drop more voltage. So this will tend to hang around its forward conductance voltage um, better than if I didn't have that 1K. The other thing is I've got a low impedance regulated power supply on this end here, which is gonna try and eliminate this signal just here. So I need some separation. I've got to separate my power from my signal. The other thing that I'm using just to help that along is I'm putting another diode in just here, just to uh, just create better separation again. So we'll apply the, and I'm gonna measure the voltage just there on the actual front end of that diode. And that's what I've got displaying just here. That is this yellow wire. So let me connect the yellow wire up as in the diagram and nothing happens apart from this voltage drops off a bit more because current is flowing through the diode and getting dropped by that 1K resistor. But I said if I connected a voltage, it would work, but of course I've got virtually no voltage here. So let's start turning up this voltage. There you go, 0.23 volts, nothing happening. 0.3, and we're just beginning to get something happening there. So I'm at 0.4 volts here, and I've got a bit of ripple on my signal. If I turn that up and try and get my trigger to capture it, there it is. We can just see the top end of my waveform. Now it doesn't look much like the top end of a sign, it's not very good. And part of the reason for that, let's bring that down a bit so we've got a better. And it's not very good at the bottom. And part of the reason for that is that we're in the non-linear part of this signal. So literally we've got plus, we've got an AC signal which goes between plus 100 and minus 100. And at plus 100, it's just getting enough to start the diode conducting a little bit into that 50 ohm load, which is the oscilloscope. <clears throat> if we look on here, we've got 0 0.6, 0 0.46 volts. So if we add the 100 millivolts, that gives us 0.56. So we're right in the non-linear region of the diode there. So it's distorting the top. If I turn this up a bit more, then we can see the signal starts coming through. Now we've got quite a clean top end of the signal. So I'm at 0.76 volts here. So the front end of this diode is varying between 0.86 and 0.6 something. 0.66 or whatever. So you can see at the bottom end of this, it's very badly distorted. Let's turn it down a bit and make that even worse. There you go. You can see it's actually clipping. As I turn it up, it stops clipping. It's now rounded. So we're actually getting a signal transfer, but it's still distorted. And it's distorted by the non-linear operation of the diode. So I need more voltage. There we go, I reckon we're about there now. So 0.92. So subtract your 100 off that, gives you 0.82. And we're clearly then in the linear region, just in the linear region of the diode. So the transfer now of that signal from the front end of the diode to the back end of the diode, anode cathode, is um, really good. And let's adjust this so we can see the whole signal. Very good, okay. If I kind of wiggle my cables around because they're a bit iffy. Whoops. And I've got about 150 millivolts peak to peak there versus the 200 input, but the 200 input will be a bit lower. Your 190 input, 152 on the output of that die. So I've got a little bit of loss happening there. There is kind of like a 
um, a forward resistance in the diode, a dynamic resistance in the diode. If I actually ramp this up a little bit and really force that diode to be a bit more saturated, then I can actually get 174 millivolts versus the 100 and whatever it was on the input. Let me have a quick look. 186 on the input, 176 on the output. So that's pretty good as a, as a switch. And that even with this diode will go right up into the hundreds of megahertz, apart from all my wires are gonna really be pretty horrible. So let's just prove that it really is a switch and remove the power supply. There we go, power supply gone, switched off. Power supply reattached, switched on. So using nothing more than that forward voltage on the diode, we can essentially create an RF switch. This is only 100 kilohertz, but yeah, I mean, we can, uh, let's demonstrate that it is an RF switch by putting it to, let's say, one megahertz uh, frequency. There we go. And uh, let's put it two megahertz. There we go. That'll be a nice frequency. <coughs> there it is, two megahertz. Um, you probably can't read that on the screen there, but it does say two. And um, yeah, absolutely fine. It just works exactly the same. There you go. And there's our switch. This is a 1N4148 diode that I'm using here. It's just a bulk standard signal diode. There's nothing special about it. You can get away with a rectifier diode, just about anything, really. In a true RF circuit, you would use um, an actual diode that's been designed for this purpose, which is a pin diode. It's going to switch better. Uh, and handle far, far higher frequencies as well. But that's the basis of using a diode as a switch. It's no different than the base to emitter in a NPN transistor, for example. You have to apply sufficient forward voltage to overcome that roughly 0.7 volt drop in that diode. And uh, you could use a transistor for exactly the same purpose here. It's just, you know, one of the legs would be dangling in the breeze. Um, okay, so I hope you enjoyed that. If you haven't come across this before, that's how it works. In practical sense, you would need to take a little bit more care in a real circuit. So you might, for example, need to insert a capacitor here, because if this has got a DC bias, that's gonna affect this diode. And then having done that, you might then need to ground reference it with let's say a 10K or 50K resistor or something in that region, just to ensure that the front end of this diode here is, um, is normally pulling down to ground with a signal applied to it and no voltage. Obviously this resistor and this resistor form a divider, so you have to think about that as well. And you do need to think that your signal is getting transferred along this power supply line. So you may need some uh, inductance, for example, on that to stop that signal going back into your supply. Obviously a diode and a resistor like this are certainly gonna help with that. But you might need some uh, additional capacitance, for example, and a bit of, uh, a bit of um, inductance to uh, help further. If this signal is high, let's say one gigahertz, then an inductor and a capacitor are gonna eliminate it off this without any problem at all. Just some ferrite beads, for example, would be uh, perfectly adequate in many situations. Anyway, that's the principle. I hope you enjoyed that. And if you haven't come across it before, that you found it very interesting. Certainly a technique that you can use for switching analog circuits with the minimum of components. I'm gonna leave it at that. And don't forget, if you haven't already done so, to subscribe and of course, like this video. See you soon, bye.